All right, First Chronicles chapter 14 and 15 is where we'll be today. First Chronicles 14 isn't very long, and 15 uh, has a lot of names, and um, help us understand what's going on between the time that David tried to bring the ark into Jerusalem, and then what he does to prepare so he doesn't have a second tragic accident. Uh, with Uzzah. And so First Chronicles 14 and 15, and I've entitled this, The Joy of God's Presence. Coming on the heels of Uzzah's tragic accident, the <laughs> intent we saw last week was good, that they wanted God's presence in a central location so that not just one household would be blessed, but so that all of Israel could come and worship as God has written that they should worship, and David was intending to build a temple. We'll, we'll find that out, but that's not his to do. It's for his son, but he's getting he's getting everything in place so that when Solomon ascends the throne as a young man, probably a teenager, that he's got everything he does, ha, needs except for the building, and so he's going to have the finances. He's going to have all of the sacred uh, articles of furniture of which the ark is necessary for the temple, and so David's plan is to build the temple and at least have everything in place when he can't build the temple, have everything in place for his son who is going to follow God in his uh, footsteps. So the joy of God's presence is, I think, the theme of 14 and 15. They were intended to have joy in 13, but it turned tragic. So it was grief and anger and fear. And now uh, these chapters are a different tone except for the end. And so I'll tell you that ahead of time. So whereas the end of 13 ends on a bright note, the end of 15 ends on a, a downer. Okay. And this is to be expected if we've read uh, second Samuel, uh, we know Michael's response isn't, doesn't match the rest of Israel. So 14, one Hiram King of Tyre sent messengers to David and cedar trees, also masons and carpenters to build a house for him. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people, Israel. I'm going to read down to verse 7. Uh, and David took more wives in Jerusalem, and David fathered more sons and daughters. These are the names of the children born to him in Jerusalem, uh, Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon. Uh, and then the other names there, the other sons. Those first four are in the earlier part of Chronicles, are uh, the sons of Bathsheba, okay? Solomon likely is yeah. uh, third or fourth uh, in line from Bathsheba, but he is by far not the oldest. Um, and so how David chooses, how David chooses his successor is likely how David was chosen by God. The youngest of son is never the king in any royal line but god doesn't choose as man chooses right mm -hmm. god looks at the heart and he sees a heart like his heart and david chooses i think solomon the same way and so i put that out there because uh, you'll see a lot of names but uh, solomon isn't chosen like david wasn't chosen uh, because of birth order but because of his heart uh back in verses one through one and two david knows something that the Lord has established him as king over Israel. Now, First uh, Chronicles uh, ten or eleven and twelve. Also, David was confirmed, and there was joy in Israel when all of Israel comes to make him king. But this happens outside of Israel. So the events of fourteen are events that happen uh, as Israel, David, king of Israel, as they interact with the kingdoms around them. There's a friendly kingdom of Tyre, um, and Hiram is going to be seen uh, later in Solomon's reign as well as donating things for the temple, in particular cedar trees and uh, and um, masons and carpenters, people to, to labor. So he also is helping, Hiram is also helping David and, uh, and Solomon, but David here. And so he's got a friendly relationship with, uh, with Hiram. And realizes that God is behind Hiram's friendliness. And then um, notice, if you will, uh, verse 2. 
that David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel. And David also knew that David's kingdom was highly exalted. And now he understands why he is exalted as king and his kingdom is highly exalted for this purpose. And this is interesting to me, the sake for the sake of his people, Israel. So David is king and David's kingdom is established with a friendly neighbor to the north so that and God gets the credit for David's David's ascent to the throne, the friendly relations. And it's for the sake of the Israelites. Anytime there's a godly king, a godly leader, everyone under them enjoys God's blessing. If there's ungodly King Saul, yeah. other people underneath him, even Jonathan, his son, is scared of, mm -hmm. rightly so, of his dad, because who knows when he's going to pick up a spear and try to hit, uh, pin you to the wall as well. Yeah. And so this is how it is in all kingdoms. So what do we learn from this? Well, there's a joy of knowing God is with you in your home. The physical house that David's going to build, he's got support even outside of the kingdom. The people, the family that he that God is building with David, isn't it's not mentioned here positive or negative, other than just the fact that he takes more wives. Now, when kings all around him and men like Elkanah, who is Samuel's dad, has multiple wives, we can see inside of Israel and outside of Israel that it's likely that this is just what kings do, and this is just what wealthy men do. They multiply wives to themselves. Um, this strikes us in a non-polygamous culture mm -hmm. as odd, uh, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. Looking at the trajectory of our culture, polygamy might not be as odd as what it is right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, If you grew up in a fundamentalist Mormon home, you would think polygamy was normal mm -hmm. in Utah and Arizona. If you lived in many other countries where polygamy is normal, uh, you wouldn't think that this passage is odd, uh, but this is. Um, we know from the New Testament, though, polygamy in the Bible is never, always brings problems to a home. We see it in David's home. We see it in Elkanah, uh, Hannah, in Samuel's home, in 1 Samuel. Uh, we see it in Abraham's home when he takes Hagar as a wife. Mm -hmm. We see it in Jacob's home when he has sisters and then their servants competing. We see it all the way back in Genesis or the second the, the, the second generation of people, Lamech, yeah. uh, and he's got two wives rebelling against God's creation uh, order just within seven generations of creation. And so it's never looked at as good in scripture. God doesn't condone it. And he clearly, it's not his plan in the New Testament. With Matthew 19, Jesus teaching on marriage is one man and one woman. Ephesians 5, uh, the husband loved his wife as Christ loved the church and obviously wouldn't take multiple wives. Mm -hmm. And then 1 Timothy 3 with the requirements of elders and deacons, the husband of one wife. So even if polygamy was or is permissible in a culture within the confines of scripture and a church, uh, the leadership in a church cannot be polygamous, okay? Uh, and that may come into play in our country in the future, all right? Wow. So it's definitely played with missionaries that are missionaries in other countries, and uh, you can talk to them and and uh, do some research and see what do they do with the polygamous chief of a, of a tribe that he gets saved, and what does he do with his three wives? And it's complicated, okay? And so, uh, but for now, um, God clearly forbids this uh, practice in the New Testament, even if it's culturally acceptable. Godly leaders, though, also knows uh, that God raises them up for the good of their people. So anytime that you are a godly leader and you're given a position of leadership and you can tell that God is with you, you're trying to honor God, you're trying to fear God and obey God and know him, um, the reason God raises up godly leaders is for the good of the people that you're leading. So that encourages humility. It doesn't encourage pride. David 
with what he understands about God in verse two doesn't cause him to exalt himself. He realizes I'm only exalted because God loves his people and he wants his people exalted. Okay. Uh, verses eight and down to 17, he talks about the Philistine war, and this is a parallel to Second uh, Samuel 5, so we're not going to go into a lot of detail other than David inquires of the Lord, uh, and whatever David inquires of the Lord, God answers him, and uh, David does exactly what um, God tells him to do in defeating them twice. Look with me at verse 12. At verse 12, they, the Philistines, left their gods there, the place where they were defeated by, uh, by David, and David gave command, and they were burned. Okay, so you remember when the Israelites took the Ark of the Covenant into battle, and when they were defeated years ago, they took the Ark of the Covenant and put it in their temple, and then they, they passed it around, and, and then they eventually sent it back to Israel. So it's likely from this story and that that they're, they take some sort of replicas, some sort of idols with them into battle thinking, oh, these are going to help me. Now we see people taking, you watch uh, the NFL and there are guys that have a cross, uh, especially kickers. <laughs> <laughs> and before they, they, before they kick a field goal or an extra point, they pull out their cross and then they cross themselves and they do something ritualistic uh, where they're showing, oh, I'm trusting in this little artifact or this something so that it, it will help me it doesn't help okay right we know that um but that's that's what we see today um but what does david do with all of these idols now later um i want to say it's Amar, uh amaziah um one of david's um great great grandchildren sons is king and he i probably messed his name up um when he fights against, I think it's the Moabites and or Edomites, and he defeats them, he takes their gods for his own and starts worshiping them. David, here's an example for the rest of the kings that come after him, his lineage. What do you do when you defeat God's enemies and your enemies with their gods that you have killed the people um, and their gods are laying there? What do you do with them? You realize they're just idols. So you pile them up, and if they're made of wood, you burn them. And like these gods did not help the people. Why in the world would you take them and worship them yourself? So David has, here is a, a good example of what to do for future kings. And some uh, didn't follow. Some didn't follow his example. So after David defeats the Philistines twice, look at verse 17. The fame of David goes out in all the lands and the Lord, the Lord brought the fear of him upon all the nations. Uh, back in the books of the law, whenever the Israelites were to go three times a year into uh, where God's presence was, they were going to go into God's presence three times a year. They were going to leave their homes, leave their families, and just the men go. Uh, God says about them, if you do this, the fear of me, I'm going to put fear in the nations all around so that when your men go off to worship, no one's going to attack you because I'm going to control the other nations fear. That's what we see here too, that God causes um, fear. The Lord is the one who gets the glory for bringing fear of David upon all nations. So David builds houses uh, for himself in the city of David. He's at least starting this. He's, mm -hmm. he's already taken over the city. It's becoming his capital. He's going to have Hiram help him build a house, probably a palace. And then he's going to have other houses. He's got a, a huge family. They're going to need a place to stay, places to stay. And so let's look at verse 2. Um, one other note uh, from verses 8 to 17. The joy of knowing God's presence, that God is with you in your life outside of your home or your home country. Godly leaders seek him for decisions, and then they use their authority to appropriate, appropriately eliminate idolatry. What are idols? Rivals to God's holy presence and worship. David did not want any of the Israelites thinking, these are legitimate gods. This is what we do with trash. We burn it. Idols are trash. <laughs> so we burn them. 
okay? And that's because it's rivals to God's holy presence and God's worship. And so uh, chapter 15, verses 1 to 15, there's joy of knowing God's word so that you can fear and obey him. First Chronicles 13, 14 said there was three months from the time that Uzzah dies and they stopped the bringing the ark, put it in someone else's house, Obed-Edom. And David uses that three months. Perhaps in this time, he obeys what God had written for kings to uh, copy God's law. Hold your hand here. Go back to Deuteronomy 17 and verses 18 to 20. This, this passage uh, has many applications and insights into the rest of the New Testament. Josiah probably does this, and that's when he realizes we are grossly disobeying God. We're in trouble. Deuteronomy 17, and then we'll look at verses 18 to 20. So God anticipates when Moses, before Moses goes, uh, um, passes away, and they go into the promised land, God anticipates that Israel is going to have kings. And this is 1400s, and they don't have a king uh, for another 400 years. Uh, and so God anticipates 350 years, maybe. So God anticipates that there's going to come a time in your history that you're going to want a king. And when you have kings, this they have to follow these laws. Okay, so these are the laws in particular for the king. And you can read 14 to 17 about what he uh, can't be a foreigner. He can't multiply wives and, and horses and, and things and silver and gold. Verse 18, though, is where we're going to focus today. And when the king sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. So the priests have to check the king's copy to see if he copied probably all of it. Yeah. And verse 19, and it shall be with him. So he writes a copy. It's approved by the Levitical priest. And then he refers, he can refer to his own copy, handwritten. The king writes with his own hand, the copy of the law. First five books, a massive amount of writing that the king has to do when he's established as a king. Mm -hmm. And it's approved by the priests that so they check it and then it shall be with him. So he's re referring to it. He has it with him and he shall read it all the days of his life. So like we read our Bible, the king writes a copy and, and he reads his own copy of God's word, at least the law here. That, so why does he do this? Verse 19 tells us why. We're in uh, Deuteronomy uh, 17. Deuteronomy 17, 19. So that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. So the king writes, it's approved. He keeps it with him. He reads it all the days of his life. So all the days that he's a king, he's referring back to, and I can't read all of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy every day, but he can read a part of it so that it stays fresh in his mind, so that he will learn to fear the Lord as God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. Verse 20, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers. So no pride here. And that he may not turn aside from the commandment, obedience from the king and from the king's heart, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom. So God has this plan that every king would do this so that every king, his kingdom would be long. We say long live the king. This was in the back of godly people who knew Deuteronomy 17 when they said long live the king. I hope the king's doing this. <laughs> I hope the king is writing and reading and and fearing God and obeying from his heart and that he and his children in Israel. So there is this uh, plan from God. Now, we don't know for sure, and it's not said to us in First Chronicles, but if David has three months to think about what went wrong, the first place that any godly person around David is going to say, did we obey what God wrote in Numbers? And the answer is no. And so it's likely that David spent some time, whether or not he wrote the whole thing out or he's going to do it um, as he's established as king. 
He takes time and it takes three months to understand what God's word says so that he would fear and obey God. And it's pretty clear now in uh, the first part of chapter 15 here that God's leader now knows and wants his kingdom to know and obey God's word. So look at verses two to five and we'll see this. So we're in first Chronicles 15 verses two to five. Then, so David prepares a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it in verse 1 of chapter 15. First Chronicles 15, 1, now 2. Then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. Whoa, this is very different than 13. Where, hey, let's just put on a new cart. Good idea. David says, no, no one. And you'll notice how David is the instrument, almost like the mouthpiece of God here. Because he knows God's word now. He says that no one may, but the Levites may carry the ark of God. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. Verse 3, and David assembled all Israel. Again, this sounds like 13, but they're, they're going to follow God's word now instead of just doing their own thing. They assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. And David gathered together the sons of Aaron and the Levites. And of the sons of Kohath, okay, that's that's the son group of the Levites, of which Aaron, the high priest, and um, at the time of Numbers, were a couple thousand men. They were to uh, take down uh, the uh, tent, the tabernacle. They, their family, the Kohathites, their family and only their family were to handle sacred furniture. They were to cover it, never to be seen by people. Uh, they weren't ever allowed to touch it. They had eyelets in the on all the pieces of furniture so that they didn't have to touch it. They had to put the poles through. They had to cover it. Then they could carry it. Yeah. Never to see, no one could see it except for the priests inside the tabernacle. And no one was allowed to carry it except for this family of the Kohathites. Kohath. The sons of Kohath, he's one of the three sons of Levi. And now we have Iriel, the chief, with 120 of his brothers. And then the second son of Levi is Marari. He's mentioned here in verse 6 with a chief and 220 of his brothers. And then Gershom is the third. And I think Marari was in charge of the tabernacle, everything, um, the covering, the poles, the tabernacle proper. And I think the last... Uh, family, the Gershomites, they were in charge of the outer rim of the tabernacle, which had a lot of curtains that were like seven and a half feet high and all the poles, and they were in charge of those. The other two families had carts that were given, but the Kohathites did not have carts because they had to carry those sacred pieces of furniture. You can see the number of men, uh, the chiefs are mentioned here with uh, so many brothers. And uh, David summons the priests, verse 11, uh, Zadok and Abiathar. Those are relatives of Aaron, descendants of Aaron, the high priest. So I think Zadok uh, is the high priest. And then the Levites are mentioned. And uh, you, will, um, you will see that David knows and wants his kingdom to know and obey God's word. Let's look at verses 12 to 15. And David said to them, you are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, make yourselves holy. This is a holy job that we're about to do. You and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. So there's a prepared place, prepared people, a prepared king who knows God's word and is going to enforce God's word must be obeyed. Why? Because he feared. He doesn't want another as a tragic accident verse 13 because you did not carry it the first time the lord our god broke out against us and we all remember that from three months ago because we did not seek him according to the rule and it's implied here that david did take this three months to seek god and obey him verse 14 so the priests and the levites consecrated themselves said so they probably washed themselves you can read about the consecration of priests earlier in uh 
in numbers that there was a, a, a washing, there were um, special garments that they wore. They did everything according to what God uh, said in, um, in the book of Numbers. And then they, uh, they're to bring up the Ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the Ark of God on their shoulders with the poles. Okay, you see all the details here. As Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. And if you read Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, you'll see that the Israelites do, do everything according to the command or the word of the Lord. That phrase over and over again we saw in the law. Now we're seeing it here, and we expect blessing now because they're doing, they're fearing, and they're obeying God. So the joy of God's presence is the joy of knowing God's word so that you can fear and obey God. Now, verses 16 to 18, David commands the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as the singers. They should play loudly. You'll see uh, Heman, the son of Joel. Joel is the son of Samuel in verse 17. Uh, and we see him in 1 Samuel's lineage mentioned in uh, First Chronicles 6. So Samuel is part of the um, Levite tribe, and he is Samuel's grandson. He's also um, so the sons of Korah. Korah was known for his rebellion, but you can see in Chronicles the lineage from Levi through Korah and to the... Um, 11 Psalms in your, in your not my Bible are mentioned as the sons of Korah. And so God doesn't wipe out all of Korah's offspring, all those that were rebellious with Korah died, but the lineage of Korah continues. And there's a godly lineage of this wicked man, Korah, who remember the earth opened up and Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they fell in and God closed the earth up when they rebelled uh, in numbers. Uh, but some of their sons, of which um, Heman is in this lineage. And we know that from First Chronicles 6. Uh, and the sons of Korah are used to write 11 of our songs. You'll see in verse 20, according to Alamoth, and then verse 21, according to Sheminith, that may have been a tune, that may have also been likely a tune or some uh, musical thing. And only one psalm, Psalm 6, has Alamoth written as um, the um, prescribed as how you use this uh, tune or sing it like this uh, with certain instruments. And then Sheminith, only, the only other time we see this is in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Uh, so they could have, uh, Psalm 6 is more of an imprecatory Psalm of God's protection. But clearly, Psalm 46 would have been appropriate for this time uh, to sing. Um, so we, we're not sure that they sang Psalm 6 and Psalm 46 here. But the only other time we see those, verse 20 and verse 21, Alamoth and Sheminith, are in the titles of Psalm 6 and 46. So there's joy here of knowing God's word so that you can obey and praise God. We've moved from fear and obey to obey and praise. And why would you have all of these people and so organized and all of the instruments and all the people's names? Obed-Edom is mentioned a couple of times here. Likely his house was housing the ark. And he's mentioned here as a gatekeeper, as uh, one of the musicians. Uh, but they're gatekeepers. They are um, following God's word. Verse 25. So David and the elders of Israel, the commanders of thousands, went up to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. Much praise here because God and because God helped the Levites, verse 26, who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. How did they know that God helped them? No one dies. <laughs> it was successful. They took it miles, probably, on their shoulders. If guys got tired, they probably substituted them in. But it was all in that family of the Kohathites. They followed God's rules. And there was great rejoicing. No one has to touch the ark uh, illegally. No one dies. And they realize when they get to their final resting place that the Lord was with us. 
And because the Lord is with us, and everybody, not just David, knows this. Everybody knows this that was part of this. They sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams of thankfulness, praise to God. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, different than his battle attire, different than his normal daily uh, attire. A robe on also where all the Levites who were carrying these would have been likely white. They would have stand, stood out in a crowd like all white. Uh, as were the Levites carrying the ark and the singers uh, and Shania, the leader of the music of the singers. And David wore a linen ephod. And so all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting to the sound of the horn and trumpets and cymbals and made loud music on harps and lyres. It's different than 13 other than they're doing it according to God's word. They're organized. It's not chaotic. It's not, let's just do what we want. The priests and Levites weren't consecrated. They were ignorant of God's word. David was as well. And they following Egyptian or uh, Philistine practices and uh, that doesn't happen here they follow god's word because of that there's joy it ends in verse 29 with not joy but sadness mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. chapter 13 ended with a ray of hope a silver lining to the tragic events of us's death here there is one person who is not happy mm -hmm. it sounds like she's the only one in israel that's not happy like everybody's happy everybody's involved everybody's organized and dancing and celebrating and we get to michael the daughter of saul she looks out the window and sees yeah. king david of the times that david is mentioned he is not given the title king david mm -hmm. except for hiram king of tyre recognized david as king but here king david is mentioned in this to signify he is a godly leader, leading, trying to lead his family and his home and his nation in the joyful presence of God. Everybody's here. Everybody is rejoicing except one. She's not happy. She's not happy. And it, we're not told uh, the, the details that were told in 2 Samuel 6 of why she wasn't happy and what the conversation went all it, all it says here is that she despised him in her heart. I think what Chronicles wants us to see here is while Uzzah dies physically, there's likely a, not a death, but someone who is dead spiritually here. If you have the ability in the Old Testament to get near God's presence and all of your nation is rejoicing that God is here, God is present, and you don't like it. Something's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. If you have, if you ever came, went to church and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and you despise God, you despise the length of the sermon, you despise people talking to you, you despise the joy of everyone else. Like, why is everybody so happy? Why is everybody talking to me? Like, if you're despising the joy of the Lord because people are enjoying God's presence. It could be that you're dead, that you don't know God. And here, I think that's what's happening here with Michael, that she doesn't know the Lord. She doesn't care that David wants to build a temple for God. She, he's not her God. And uh, she's not part of the celebration. She's part of the rebellion despising him in her heart and we're told in second samuel that she died without children uh, we don't know why uh, that is but there's a tragedy here that someone is likely dead spiritually not because of ignorant disobedience like 13 but of willful ignorance as david and the, and the nation are learning to know what god says obey what god says fear what god says Rejoice now that they're doing what God says she's left out, just observing and, and despising in her heart. Will for ignorance. And we see this in the time of Christ. We see this today when people are exposed to the glory of God and they don't want it. They don't want Jesus. They don't want his church. They don't want the joy of God's presence. God starts giving them over, as Romans 1 says, to do whatever they want. And their hearts get dark and hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. That's what we see here uh, today, and it's tragic. 
So how do we apply this today? How do we know and experience God's presence today? When Jesus was on earth, he says, I'm not going to leave you without my presence. I'm going to send my spirit. We have it better than the Israelites did with the ark in their midst. We have it better than the disciples and the people of earth on Jesus was on earth. We have the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ in us. God's best gift is God's spirit in us. This is how we enjoy and experience God's presence. And the fruit of the spirit is love, joy. And evidence that we have God's presence is we have the joy. And we see joy in this passage because of the presence of God. It's all around what God, who God is and what he's done and what he's going to continue to do for Israel and his people. The Holy Spirit also helps us to know and understand and fear and obey God's word, which the Holy Spirit knows leads to joyful worship. It leads us to the cross. It leads us to being like David was and all the people around him like, oh, we're so glad God is here. He's with us. And this is how we are every Sunday. And we can be this way in our homes and in our private study of God's word that we're so glad that we can see God and understand him and know him and walk with him and rejoice in that we are his child and he chose us and such wonder and joy that is ours. And this is how two things that we can apply this today. We'll pick up in uh, chapter 16, Lord willing, next week.